Okay, morning all, hello and welcome to this live monthly demo for July 2020. Uh, this demo is an opportunity for anyone interested in Exonar's data discovery tech to see it in action. Every month we try and change things up a bit, so today we're asking the question, how do you know if your data is violating policy? And we're going to show you how to answer that question with Exonar Reveal, our world-leading data discovery product. Now, um, I'm James McCarthy, the CMO at Exonar. I'm joined by Tom, um, who I've literally this time crowned our demo king. Tom, I hope you like the addition of your crown. Um, Tom's from our customer success team and spends every day with customers, helping them to get the best out of our technology. He knows exactly how to solve common data problems and customers that customers face using our stuff. So welcome, Tom. How are you this morning? I'm doing great, thanks, James. How are you? Enjoying the crown? Oh, yeah, I love the crown. Did I you did you prefer crown. Demo God or Demo King? I don't know. I don't know. I'm kind of indifferent. <laughs> Fair, enough. Fair enough. So um, today's agenda, uh, we're going to be looking at the challenge presented by over-retained data, a very common problem for organizations. We're going to look very quickly at, at data discovery so that you understand what you're looking at. We'll give you a really quick overview of Exonar Reveal, and then we're going to demo you three different scenarios or three different areas, feature sets within our technology. The demo is being recorded, so you don't need to take any notes or screenshots or anything like that. Uh, we will be publishing this demo on YouTube in our YouTube channel. I'll talk about that later. Uh, of course, um, I don't need to remind you that the biggest benefit of turning up to these is to interact with us. Um, so you should be able to find a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen during the session. Please make use of it. Uh, it'll make the session a lot better if it's interactive and we'll do our best, of course, to cover and show anything that you want to see um, as you raise it with us. So holding sensitive data for too long, even if it's being held securely, can violate GDPR. So um, we all know about those, that legislation. We all know about data policy. Over-retention, as I said earlier, is probably one of the biggest challenges around there. Um, but it also unnecessarily exposes customers' data um, and it's something that people struggle really to want to delete as well, which is another issue we might talk about in Q&A uh, if you have questions in that space. It only takes one unfortunate incident involving sensitive data. And of course, you've got a breach, whether that's driven by external cyber attack or, or internal slip up. So the company really is faced with, with three possible options. Um, you can remove the data um, that breaches your policy around retention. Um, you can try and anonymize it, so redact the, the relevant pieces that are sensitive and then keep the data for analytics pur um, purposes. And of course, that's um, one way you can go about it. Or of course, um, there is a third option too, but um, hoping the problem's going to go away probably isn't really a very sensible strategy. Um, in reality, either option one or two can seem like a mammoth task. Um, if you choose to remove the data, it requires you to be able to search all of it and know what you've got uh, that are both sensitive and old enough that they should no longer be retained. And it may be easy enough to erase hard copy data, but digital data often leaves a trace. Copies and duplicates may reside in forgotten file servers and databases. If you choose to anonymize it, you've got to be certain that other information doesn't exist that could be used in conjunction to identify an individual. So. Um, data discovery is the crucial software enabling organizations to overcome a range of challenges, including over-retained data and many other data challenges for that matter. Um, so by creating a single comprehensive and instantly searchable index of your data, you can easily search for stuff that meets given criteria, set up automatic workflows and view all of your data from simple dashboards. And what makes Exonar different from any other data discovery tech on the market is our ability to see both unstructured and structured data at huge scale across the organization, including the detail in that data. So the content within each item, as well as the metadata. And to give you an idea of how we're able to create that, uh, it's a good idea to make sure everyone really quickly understands what we do. So this diagram is a bit busy, um, but it kind of summarizes how we go and connect to people's data um, sources um, across their organization, both in the cloud and uh, file servers, exchange servers with email in them, et cetera. We then ingest all that information and it's unstructured and structured information, all your documents, emails, text, et cetera, 
um, rows of databases as well. And we put that in a local um, big data storage, we kind of call it. And the important thing to note that all of this happens on your, um, in your data environment, not in ours. So none of our software runs in our environment, it runs in your environment, because of course the stuff that goes into that um, is very sensitive and it's your crown jewels. And of course we need to make sure that you retain control over that at all times. From there, we add some natural language processing and some pattern matching to enrich the data. So we're actually looking to identify topics, identify specific types of data within there. Uh, PII is a really good example, valid credit cards, etc., so that we can enrich the data for the purposes of searching it. Um, and before you search it, we put it in a big index, uh, which is a single comprehensive and instantly searchable index of billions of items of data. It's a little bit like Google search for your enterprise. So in the same way as Google indexes the web, we index corporate data. And then the fifth step there is really important as well. So we refresh it. So your data is changing all the time. Your organization is changing all the time. Just because you cleaned up the sensitive data uh, last month doesn't mean that there isn't new sensitive data that's out of policy, that's basically uh, coming into your estate and needs to be dealt with. So making sure that index is up to date is really, really important to us. So let's move on to today's demo. There's three areas we're gonna look at. We're gonna talk about advanced search and how you find that over-retained data we're talking about. We're gonna talk about data visualization so you can understand that data. And then we're gonna talk about uh, workflows that help you automate um, some of the tasks involved in over-retention. Um, one more reminder, please, um, questions as they come, um, we'll deal with them as we can. And so um, just let us know as we go. All right, so advanced search. Um, what this enables you to do is search billions of items of information. So I talked about that index, all of your data is in there. The question is, how do you then search and what tools are available to make that possible? So um, if you'd like to grab the screen, Tom, um, okay. you can take us through that bit, please. Okay, fantastic. So what I'm going to do, just before I go into advanced search, just kind of give you a bit of background. And so I'm going to head into our data overview dashboard. Um, and so and all the data that you see uh, in this live demo is in our demo platform. And what you're, it's, what you're seeing, it's a spread of data across a variety of data sets and business areas throughout a company. And ultimately, the data is it, all of the data I'm showing is just the data I have access to. So it would apply in, uh, in, in, in actual like implemented systems as well. So what you're seeing here is I have access to about 10 and a half terabytes of data. And that includes about 550,000 items, which could be a combination of uh, different file types, so say emails or, uh, you know, Excel documents, PowerPoint, so on and so forth. Um, so what I'm going to do now is actually search and interrogate that data. So if I hit search, um, I've already got it. So it went straight to advanced search and advanced search is essentially it's just like a blank canvas and it allows you to build queries from the ground up, um, searching for certain types of files and keywords, just trying to maybe focus in, particularly in this uh, demo is, is those retention policies and things like that. So they're the sorts of things you then use to build up a query. Um, so if I go to the top here, I can actually uh, load up some of the templates that we already have in the platform. Uh, and so again, again, a lot of these will have, uh, will have retention policies linked to them. Uh, and so here are just a few examples that Exonal has out the box. And so you see variety of file types from health information, CV files, passwords in plain text, um, passport information, payroll, bank account information, and so on. Uh, these are very much like templates, get you started sort of thing, and then you can refine them based on your own data type. But I'm just going to pick uh, you know one of the more sensitive ones and so let's uh let's go for yeah let's go for the payroll um the salary and payroll information one and so what you're seeing here is just uh, obviously the template the query uh you can then add to this remove stuff from it depending on what's appropriate to your data um, and essentially what we're searching is a combination of any of those metadata fields that we actually uh, that, that we extract and store 
uh, and those are searchable too. So there's about 100, just to give a bit of background. They're, they're, they're all on the left-hand side and they can just be dragged from left to right to, um, to further build that query. But let's, let's run this one, uh, this payslip query, just as, it's, as it stands. Um, and so what you're seeing here, again, is the power of the index. So straight away, it's come back with the result. And so you're seeing 1,800 results uh, roughly, and their variety of documents from PDFs, spreadsheets, emails, and so on. But let's look, have a look at some of the documents themselves. So let's start off with the very first one. If we click in on here, what we're now seeing is Exonar's, uh, essentially the document um, inspection. Um, and so just to kind of give you some background as to what you're seeing here, uh, you're, you're seeing on the bottom left hand side, you're actually seeing the body or the content of the document. Um, so, you know, the, the content of the email, the content of the Word document and so on. It's just there in plain text. And you'll notice some of the search highlighting. So this is one of the most powerful features is any of those search uh, search items that I have in my query, it will then highlight where it matches it in the actual body or the content of that document. And so you can go straight to it. And we can see here very quickly and easily, it's a payslip, it has a pay date, a tax code, um, gross pay, uh, and so on. And so we can quickly identify that it is a payslip. Um, on the right hand side here, we actually see search hits and this, this comes into play when you when we have, you know, like really large files to look at. And so essentially it's just showing you exactly what it's matched on. It's clear, it's, it, it's not showing any of the, fit, the filler, so to speak, and it's just straight to the point. And so you can see the surrounding context around that as well. Again, just to kind of reinforce uh, the, the, the way you can quickly identify what you're looking at uh, using Exona. Um, then, as I go around, uh, you see uh, how, how, how we can actually tag documents of interest over here. Uh, we can apply common tags, which happen to have been frequently applied on our data already. Um, and then we can just tag through items too. Uh, this, again, not going to dive, dive, dive much deeper uh, than, than I have done so far, but we can actually then take a look at those metadata fields as well, go directly into those, uh, we can open the file, and then we can also compare similar files. So actually in this case, it might make sense to kind of show, show, show off that just quickly. Uh, and so what you're seeing here is a list of files that we have uh, basically generated a confidence score uh, oh, and the confidence score essentially means uh, it's a percentage based on the content within the document and its similarity to some of the others. And so you're seeing, again, different pay slips that, uh, you know, have very similar content and that you, you would expect that, right? Given that's pay slip, same structure, we're looking at maybe one company's bit, bit, bit of data as well, which makes it even more likely. Uh, and so, yeah, that's just to kind of quickly show you that. Um, but yeah, that's one of the ways in which you can you can uh, search search using Exon on use our advanced search. So yeah, back over to you, James. Okay, great stuff. All right, so um, so that's the starting point. You found the information you want using our advanced search capability. You can then refine that as as Tom's been talking about. The next thing to do is um, to get an overview of of where that over retained data is. So you found the information with the search. What you now want to do is be able to visualize that and really understand that data set. Um, so in the second part of the demo, we're going to look at how you use visualizations to see that. Um, and that way, organizations can identify areas where remediation actions can be taken, which dramatically reduces the risk of data being compromised. And of course, the other thing there is that um, it enables organizations to really understand if there's one data source or something else that's um, that's making this happen or if it's if it's happening across multiple places etc and so the kind of questions that the um, the user or the uh, employee is going to be asked themselves is um, I found data that breaches our retention policy I now need to know where that is and, and who is holding that information and how it's coming about that we're over retaining it so yes we're going to clean it up but where did it come from and is this a problem that we need to fix from a process perspective so if you'd like to grab that screen back, Tom, yep, and go we'll, through this bit. Okay, fantastic. So yeah, just to continue on the same path as we, we were going on, I'm going to focus in on the pay slips. 
And so, yeah, I'm going to start building some visualizations, which are essentially um, almost like interactive dashboards that you saw at the start, but, um, but uh, they're actually uh, just visual representations of that data using all those metadata fields that I said, there's a hundred metadata fields. And so what I'm going to do here is build a few just to kind of give me a good sort of summary of that data. And so what I'm going to start with is just actually looking at the creation date. So if I head to here, I can create an age chart. And then we have the, these, are, these just happen to be the categories of those metadata fields. Um, if you hit common and then creation date. Now we have a visual representation of all those pay slips and when they've been created. So all the way from, in this case, 96 through to 2018. Um, so again, it gives us a great idea of which ones may be in and out of policy straight away just by looking at the chart. I'll show you how to interact with the chart shortly. Um, another way in which we might be interested in adding to this and giving us more context is looking at our data sets. Um, firstly, I need to explain what data set is. So, Essentially, a data set is how we map your data sources. And a data source is a connection to one of your systems. So it might be uh, to a mailbox on an exchange server. It might be to a folder on a file share. Um, it could be uh, to a SharePoint site and so on. And then you give it a reference. And so sometimes it's appropriate to give it a you know, like a departmental reference, and so finance or legal or whatever. And other times when you don't really know or cross depart, people across different departments use it, um, you know, then you would maybe need to change it uh, appropriately. Uh, and so, yeah, so here it's focused in on is the data where it should be. So when I'm looking at this data set chart, I'm looking for, okay, so I have a lot of pay slips in finance. I would expect that. In the government data set, maybe I wouldn't. HR, yes, but then users, uh, and to me, this looks to be users' personal drives or home drives. And so, yeah, so you're seeing those items straight away probably aren't where they should be. Uh, so then now let's add to that another visualization. And so if I now go apply another bar chart for here, I can actually add authors. And so if I wanted to individually look at those files and who created them uh, and so on, again, now I have another chart that I can look at reference from. Um, I can actually add more items to this. So I can add a hundred results if need be. Uh, I can actually stretch this chart as well to make it easier to read according to, uh, according to what I need. I'm just gonna go back to 20 just to show off those. And then finally, I'm going to add the source type. So you might be interested in, okay, so what systems is that data coming from? And so what I'm gonna do is just another bar chart in this case. Again, a lot of bar charts, not many of the others, but that just, just happens to be what I'm searching for, to be honest. Uh, and so if I head over to source type, now I have a, you can see how I've created um, like almost like a dashboard but I've set of four visualizations, which give me a very good summary of what's in my data. So when we're focused on retention, how about we actually go and in, uh, interact with one of these charts? So all these charts are in, you, know, drill, drill, you can drill down on and you can interact with. And so for here, I might be interested in those documents that are over five years. So if I now highlight that area, now we'll be focused in on those documents that basically were created between 96 and uh, the first of the first 2014. And so now you can see that we've gone from those 1800 results, I think it was, down to 712. And we can actually then export that and action that in a way that James just described a second ago. Uh, equally, you'll notice that the other charts change too. And so we can get an idea. So a lot of those old documents do actually happen to be in the users area. Um, again, finance, business services, admin even. And then we can also see uh, the authors too. Again, some people like that, some people don't. Some people, they want a more like a, a nudge-like policy, a more lenient policy sort of thing, as opposed to a strict policing. So, you know, where the, that might not be appropriate, but then source type, 
in this case happens to all be file shared, but that will just depend on what you integrate into our platform. But then what you can do on top of this and go into those user files, and if we click in on those, now we've got 250 results uh, that, uh, yeah, 250 pay slips that we might actually want to do something about. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, that is exactly what we're going to do. We can then export that and action it. So, yeah. I love the breadcrumb in here as well. So as you've, as you've clicked down and filtered, you know, whenever you use technologies that allow you to drill in on, uh, on charts and things, you can end up in a pickle where you want to go backwards and you accidentally click on the wrong thing. What I love about what we do here is the breadcrumb along the top. That means that you can go back if you click on the wrong thing and you don't end up down a rabbit hole. Yeah, exactly. So just to kind of show that off a little bit more, now I've gone into a particular author's area, I can actually go back to those creation dates that I was interested in initially, yeah. and then I can load up that display at the bottom here, and then actually, like I showed you before, individually inspect these items too. Um, so yeah, back over to uh, you, James. Great. Okay. Thank you for that. So, so now we've looked at advanced search. We've looked at visualizations of that and getting to know how that works. And that's all within a, an individual search. The next thing that happens, of course, is that we need to go a little bit further and make that business as usual. So what Tom's had to do today to do that is he's had to build that search and go and manually search out stuff. He's gathered the results back. But how can I easily monitor data sets moving forward to identify items before they breach retention policy or I suppose as they are breaching retention policy as I try and improve adherence to that so um, Tom if you want to um, cover that bit that would be great of course so I'm going to like I said continue on the same story as I've been going on so far and so again I've just gone back to our payslip query that I just showed you guys and so if I scroll down to the bottom here I'm actually going to add uh, the retention policy so uh, for the, in this case I'm just going to say five years someone out there in HR or finance would actually pretty be able to correct me a more accurate one but let's um, let's let's have a look at the creation date and so what we're going to do is we're going to drag that over to the bottom then basically make it a relative date so in the last five years I'm going to then because of the logic the billion logic you can use disable that so essentially now I'm looking for anything older than five years and so now I'm going to rerun the same search I'm going to get my results um, that could have actually been so yeah that gives yeah that gives a spread that I expected and now I'm going to create this into a workflow and so what is a workflow a workflow is essentially a query on a schedule um, and there are a few neat things you can do like notifications and various things like that But I'm just going to quickly go through and give you an example of what you can or show you what you can do So I'm just going to create a name and description for that with this workflow again It's of, in reality. I would call it a pay slip daily workflow or weekly workflow um, Then the next step in the creation is to set that to a daily weekly monthly or quarterly basis in this case I'm just going to run it to be daily. Um, we can then automatically do, apply actions to this. And what we can do is apply tags automatically. And so if any items we, we, we find with the payslip search, we want it to tag those items to be payslips, we can do that. And so automatically tag uh, those items as payslips uh, and then yeah, it will do that and that enables us to then easily export them later on. Um, you don't have to do that, of course, uh, and then you can add notification preferences. So you can notify when you log in, send a separate email as well, uh, depending on what is appropriate for you. And then you can share this workflow with other users. So I can then enable this box. I can find other platform users and I can actually uh, basically, you know, so say uh, James, for example, I can share my payslip workflow with James. I can give him edit permissions if necessary or just notify him. So, for instance, in this scenario, maybe I, I need it reviewed or maybe I need it escalated to someone that has a higher 
permission level than myself or has a, a is, is the only one who can actually do something about that data um, in which case I can apply the appropriate actions uh, so what I'm going to do here is update and close hit next I can then customize the email as I see appropriate basically customize the actual HTML of the, of the uh, email itself and then finally I can create that but what does that create? I'm just going to now show you one that I made earlier. And so I'm gonna go into our list of workflows. Uh, and so yeah, front, front to bottom, basically, these are all the ones that I have access to in the Exonar platform. And so if I click on the passwords discovered here, this one I know has been running, uh, been running since early January. So yeah, so what you're seeing here now is a breakdown. It's basically just all it is, it's a workflow that's been running daily since the 12th of January and any files that look to be passwords in plain text, it's then displaying that. And so it's been running daily since then. And so what you're seeing here is just a summary of it. Again, whether or not you've applied automatic tags and who has access to it uh, is also uh, is also some of the settings you can look at and then you see on the right hand side here you see that full workflow history and so any new items found and the total items are being tracked here and so you can go through and see for instance on the 19th of February that 2163 new items have been found and so as you action and remediate this data you actually see the corresponding progress too and you can build that into your workflows. It adds another, le another level of complexity, but it also adds another level of granularity too. And so that's the really powerful thing, is you can make these workflows interact with each other, essentially. And so any of these dates I can click in on. And then finally, at the bottom here, is the full history of that workflow. And I can click in on any of these dates. So let's go from day one. So if I click on day one, the 12th of January in this case, oh, it doesn't look to be day one, it looks to be the cutoff point, but that's fine too. On the 12th of January, we just had the one new item, but let's see if actually in the one after that, that has 212 new items. So on the Monday 13th of January, uh, we actually got 100, uh, 212 new items, and we can actually look at those as you are seeing here. We can tag them as we see fit, individually or collectively and so yeah that is essentially uh, what you can do with workflows James. Brilliant all right thank you very much so um, we've covered uh, three things there advanced search visualizations and workflows and of course the one other thing I wanted to mention was how our index could then also be used more autonomously to do things like redaction and remediation um, one of the exciting things in our product roadmap is that we're going to be publishing and documenting our API for release next quarter. And that's a big step for us because it enables third party technologies to come in and exploit the index to do some of those things automatically um, and to basically round out solutions around uh, automating your data governance or indeed automating the process of um, over retention or dealing with over retained data. Um, and what that means is we're going to be looking at technologies to build integrations with, but also working specifically with customers to integrate some of their existing solutions to make that possible. So I'm not going to go into any great detail in terms of demo on that. I just wanted to round out the point. We talked about remediation. We talked about redaction. This is how you would then go to make that a more automated process. And it's a direction we're absolutely going in um, right now with our roadmap. So I just wanted to put that one in there. Two. Okay, so with that, we're going to move on to our Q&A. The floor is open. You've all been very quiet, um, which is somewhat disappointing, uh, but we do have a couple of questions. Um, so the first one, you've shown retention policies as five years. Would this be customizable depending on the organization? Yes, uh, is, is a simple answer to that question. So uh, like you just saw me basically customizing the query at the end there so that 
it was five it was five years um you could change that to be any any any, any date or even date range if you want to be specific and say a specific six month period you can do that you can look at that date range or you can look at a relative date where you can just say oh in the last like how many years or so on so yeah if it was seven years instead i could have changed that last query term that i did to be seven um and then you know combine that with whatever uh type of file you're looking for essentially yeah, so essentially when we're building advanced searches, we're looking to replicate what our policy within our organization actually says. So if our policy is three years, not five years, then we write our advanced search and hone it around exactly what our policy needs to be, I guess. Save that search, turn it into a workflow, et cetera, et cetera. Perfect, yeah. Exactly. Great, thank you. And um, the second one is when performing a search across multi-user mailboxes, is it possible to identify the top mail chain as part of an email conversation? That's an interesting question. Um, top mail chain, mm. does that resonate with you, Tom? Do, do you I, th I, think, I think I see what, what we're trying to get at. So when you, uh, when we in, in index, or, uh, you know, um, from different people's mailboxes, uh, we do actually track the hierarchy uh, of emails and so, just like, for instance, um, it's probably not the best comparison for everybody, but a zip file, for instance, and how you have, you know, you have your zip file and then you have all your sub files within the zip as well. We index that and we actually track the hierarchy so you can actually see the full tree uh, within the zip. It's exactly the same concept uh, within emails as well. Uh, and so when you see, uh, when you see um, an email, you can actually see the reply to it too. Um, great that's really good uh, martin i think i'll ask that question if that hasn't answered your question please um come back to us um either afterwards or we can try and deal with it now we're running a little bit low on time but hopefully we answered that one uh, the next question from andy is what is typical training requirements for exonar users um i guess you can answer that i can answer that go for it tom oh what's typical training for exonar users yeah um, so yeah, so what, what the, the way in which we generally do it is we start off with an initial session, which is um, I get, you, we usually allocate you know a couple hours for it, and it's an initial session, basically introduce everyone to the platform and the various areas of it, and then generally we have a couple of follow up sessions as well that uh, that essentially kind of reinforce that learning from the from the first session, and then we kind of we can work with the users or the data owners to actually fine tune things uh, for what for what they need uh, so yeah that's that's generally how it works we have had uh if, for instance in in some organizations where actually instead of it just being three or session we actually have a couple of several more um just to kind of help that learning and make sure that everybody you know has had time to use the platform try it out for themselves come across uh, areas in which they need our help and so on uh, and so yeah that's ge that's generally uh, the sort of logic and process yeah and i think i'd, I'd just uh, provide a little sneaky peek um, for something we're about to announce this month in our latest release of software is um, a feature that helps with tutorials as well so yeah absolutely the formal training and making sure that that users are up to date but as things change we've got a um, a tutorial tool uh, which is going to allow you to to work through specific use cases within uh, within our software with a kind of guided tutorial approach, which looks really really good. So we might demo that next time around because it'll be new. Um, but uh, but that's another way. So if users haven't have been trained, but then maybe they've gone away for a few months, or new users come on board, and you get a certain amount of of sort of churn in these things, uh, tutorials are a really really good way of helping people to self learn as well, of course, as having um, you know, more formal training as well. Uh, I'm going to rattle on really quickly because we're, we're slightly over, but we've got some really good questions coming in here. And I like this one from David. Um, hi, David, by the way, I haven't seen you for a while. Um, hope you're well. Um, hi, James. One challenge with over-retained data is identifying the trigger data to apply retention policies. Date of last action or last mod modified date probably is often updated daily by system scans. Uh, which creates false positives in results. Does Exonar have a suggested solution? I think the, sol the, the solution we would apply is we would go by, by the date created rather than the date last modified. But Tom, you might have an opinion on that. 
Uh, yeah, so actually we, we don't modify the original file. What we do is when we access it, we, we, we can uh, essentially uh, impact on the last access date instead. So when we access a file and we do the indexing, we get the you know, body and all the metadata and so on, all, all, all that stuff that we've just been talking about. Um, we actually, uh, it's the last access date, which we then- yeah. maybe, maybe that's what David means actually. So, so, yeah, uh, and yeah. so what, yeah, so what we can do, so creation date and modified date stay, stay the same unless, uh, yeah, for, and so those stay the same. And then what we can do is we can enable basically um, a field in the back end, which essentially, um, which which overwrites the last access date after we've accessed it. Essentially, so it so it basically, as we look at far, as we index that file, we we track the original last access date. Um, we then do our indexing, and then we apply the original one to uh back to that document um so that's one way we can do it again just to, it just just depends um and i guess also that it i think david's also referring maybe to the fact that other systems other than our own might be using might be adjusting that access date which could then throw up false positives so the other way of doing that is to build your advanced search around when the document was created so pay slips are a really good example um, the real age of that payslip is not last time it was accessed, it's actually when the payslip was issued, which is the created date, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, there is, it's a really good, um, really good question, David. Um, I think it's a case of refinement. We can do those things, so we can look at all of those dates, but I think we would probably uh, recommend using the created date in terms of the sensitive data itself, in terms of the retention of it. Um, and hopefully that answers your question. Um, which means that we are running over time, really. Um, we want to try and keep these things brief. So thank you so much for those questions. It's much appreciated. Um, and we're going to wrap up this session. Um, so thank you for joining us. A uh, reminder that our next live demo is on August 20th. We'll be looking at tackling data migration, which involves understanding and cleaning data sets in preparation to migrate that data to new systems, for example, into the cloud. And it's a, a use case that we often see with our customers. We've got a number of customers that are still migrating data, cleaning data. We'll talk about some of those issues. You can also go to our website and view our other resources. You can see the link there, uh, exonar.com slash resources. You can also visit us in YouTube at the Exonar uh, channel, uh, which contains recordings of all of our webinars and live demos. This live demo will be up there in the next couple of days as well. Uh, and of course, we also post interesting stuff in uh, LinkedIn and Twitter too. So that's it. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, Tom, for your demoing capability as always. And um, thanks for joining us. We look forward to seeing you again soon.